believe that they're not as humble? I think power tends to withdraw humility from human beings on the whole. It, um, power tends to block up the ears of people. Um, it tends to introduce um, spectacles so thick and so impenetrable over the eyes that they see a completely different reality. I'm not saying that politicians on the whole are not well-meaning people. I'm just saying that they have a greater responsibility um, to overcome all the obstacles that power puts in their path, mm -hmm. that power um, puts between them and us. The more, the more politicians care about human beings and care about us, the greater they must overcome um, all the fences that power gives them. They've got mm -hmm. to come down from the hill and come and listen to us and suffer with us. In other words, they have to be greater human beings. Than us. Than us, yeah. yes. So politics is language. In, um, and language, in effect, is also power. Politics is language plus vision. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to go to, to something else, and okay. language can be used, uh, is, is a power. There is a power in you as a writer to actually, if you like, open our closed boundaries as a reader to make us imagine and transcend. Is language also repressive? Oh yes, language is very repressive, yes. Language can be both repressive and uh, uh, liberating. Um, but what fascinates me in, in relation to the novel as a form is that where language is most powerful is where language is least noticed. In other words, language, like all truly powerful things, has to be a great servant. Um, and a great servant should not be noticed. In other words, the, the novelist's job is to enchant, to tell you a good story or to have a beautiful tone of voice, or to have a good voice, just a beautiful voice. So that you listen, you read, you turn the pages. If you forget yourself, you, you forget your problems, you forget who you are, you're, in, you're drawn into this other world that is, it may be more painful and it may be more suffering in it, but for some reason, it's more, it's preferable to the world you're living in. Um, Alden called um, the great novel uh, he called the great poem. He said, a great poem is, quote, very nearly a utopia. I think that's what a novel should always aim to be. It should always be somewhere better than where you are. Mm -hmm. The novelist draws you into this world in order to tell you the difficult truths about this world. So all novelists are con men or con women. They're tricksters. Mm -hmm. They're Doing, they're inducing something very pleasant over you in order to tell you something quite unpleasant. Um, it's that's, that's the magic of language. That's the magic of language, but it's also connected to storytelling. Mm -hmm. I think our era has forgotten the power of storytelling. Um, I think we've... I'm a great believer in experimentation. The family story is also about experimentation with language, with form, with all of those things. I think because we've lost uh, our respect for storytelling and for enchantment, it means that in a way we have lost the capacity to um, bring the reader over to our side. To just, you know what Orpheus used to do? He'd play the flute and wild animals would just slowly sink into the ground and would just become very... That's what literature should do. Literature should quieten the argos in us, shut down all those eyes of suspicion, of neurosis, of anger, of rage, of deception, of bewilderment. Shut all those eyes, let all those things go to sleep, let all the rage, mm -hmm. the hunger, the pain calm down, and, and then, um, then beauty should be introduced into the soul. Um, or a new kind of truth, or an old truth, which we've forgotten to pay attention to. And this can be done best, I feel, by going back to the power of storytelling. Um, 
which has in, in a sense maybe not totally disappeared in, I will use that category, the, in Western literature, that it doesn't seem to be as prominent. In, yeah. In the sense that, that you are talking about, I mean, how much does a novel seduce someone today? Well, this is this is a thing. I mean, it's. Um, I think it's. I think it's a sadness, and I think that's why the novel is losing the fight, losing the battle. Um, I believe the novel is an incredibly important form. It's, it's virtually the only form in which you have that particular kind of solitude in which soul can speak to soul. Do you know what I mean? It's just you and the words. It's not you and the writer. The writer is somewhere else. It's you and your own soul, and it's you in your own room with the door shut. And no one is peeking at your conscience. No one is making you feel uncomfortable. It's not a public act. It's a private self-investigation um, done through deception. It's a very important form. It's too important for us to, 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 to waste um, in, in areas whereby we don't get people to listen anymore. We have to get people to listen. If you don't do it through story, you should certainly do it through a beautiful tone of voice. Uh, mm -hmm. Something's got to be done whereby you can induce people to listen, pay attention, to just listen, to want to listen. Um, and then you can say anything in the world you want. Camus did that with The Outsider. Mm -hmm. um, Kafka did it with The, the Trial. Um, all the great modern writers managed to do it. Um, but I, I do take your point that we were, we're losing one another in the dialogue. And I, it saddens me. So how does one discover a new language? I think, I suspect it's by rediscovering our basic passions, our basic joys, maybe even rediscovering our, uh, the homeland of our suffering. I think we need to go back to the bedrock of what being alive really means. Mm -hmm. um, Rilke felt that um, music came out of um, came out of sorrow. Um, I partly agree with him. Um, I can see how a deep kind of sorrow. What was that Greek phrase he used that was the title of that? Sparagmos. Yes, sparagmos, yes. I, I can see how a deep kind of agony can be the fountain of a, of a deep and beautiful sort of music, the origin of, of singing. I can, I can see it. Um, I, that's the magic of the human spirit, that you feel that agony, and you don't die, you sing, almost as if you're consoling your own soul, or as if you're consoling the air. I think we need to go back to our, to our, to our spiritual, to our emotional, to our sensual origins. We need to peel off all these layers that we have piled on us to go back to the river, or another way you put it in, in the book is humans are more scared of falling in love than dying. Yes, should we actually get the exact phrase? Human beings, it's what you said is absolutely correct. Um, in terms of how I feel, I'm not, one cannot make prescriptions about this at all, but I feel, yes. What do we have here? Human beings, uh, human beings, um, Ah, I wish one could find this. We are more afraid of... It is more difficult to love than to die. It is more difficult to love than to die. It is not death that human beings are most afraid of. It is love. The heart is bigger than the mountain. One human life is deeper than the ocean. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. And as I said, um, I was telling you earlier, it's one of the very few novels that actually seduced me in that sense, that it became very, very plain and simple. And you just get into the magic, which I think we've lost, or we're losing. Well, I, I, is, it that we've, is it that we've lost it, or is it that we have deceived ourselves into thinking we're more complicated than we actually really are? I mean, are we as complicated as we think we are? I mean, we seem to, we seem to I don't know, we, the modern human being seems to feel the need to make um, a deity out of their complication. 
we seem to like being neurotic. We may be neurotic, mm -hmm. we may be alienated, but we're also people who, faced with crises, national crises, personal crises, are capable of weeping, a pure kind of weeping. We're capable of a pure kind of joy. If the, if the conjunction of experience gets us at the right time, the right point, we're capable of this pure expression. So that purity, that simplicity is always there. Why don't we affirm that more? Why do we affirm the neurosis? Possibly because we haven't got a memory. What's happened to our memory? Well, that's the problem, I think. That's what is our biggest problem. I don't know. We sometimes, I mean, I've had this discussion um, a lot with um, friends in, in London, in Nigeria, and various places. And um, sometimes we, we think that maybe we've become overwhelmed by history. But then we're always overwhelmed by history. I wouldn't say overwhelmed. I think we've forgotten history. I think history has become another advertisement, if you like. You mean it's become instant? Yes. I think that what happened then cannot touch us now because we're much better. And we never realized that just around the corner it could happen again. Because I think people have forgotten the fact that history repeats itself, in a sense. Or it, if it doesn't repeat itself in exactly the same way, it's a spiral. And it always seems to come back to us. It's interesting you choose the word spiral because one of the, the, one of the key themes of the famished road is this cyclicity that I talk about, of the spirituals coming and going. Um, and I use that very much as a metaphor also for, the, um, for eternal recurrences, for recurrences in history, um, in nationhood, in events that happen to us. But also extending the whole idea, this whole idea of the Abiku cycle. Um, it is my belief that for anything to actually enter into reality, a certain intensity of human sacrifice and seriousness and willingness and joyfulness makes it stay in reality. In just the same way that in order to induce a spirit child to want to live and to stay, every, the parents of spirit children have to they have to transcend themselves in their capacity to love. In other words, they can't just be ordinary parents. They have to be what we have to be. In other words, attentive, imaginative. They have to listen. They have to be sympathetic. They have to, they have to seduce the child into, into, into the mysteries and the wonder of life. And I think just as we do that with children, so we have to do it with whatever new realities we want to create. Um, and I feel, therefore, that we may have very beautiful visions. I think what our problems, or what our problem tends to be, is that we don't bring enough will and enough love and enough joy to our visions of how we can transform our lives.